For many years, the United Mine Workers was John L. Lewis, mainly because Lewis was the head of the union for over 40 years, only retiring in 1960. His departure left a UMWA whose membership was beginning to drop because of mechanization, strip mining, and increased competition from the oil industry. His successor was a man named Thomas Kennedy, and Kennedy's vice president was a Montana coal miner named W.A. Boyle, also known as Tony Boyle, who had the power behind the throne. Now, Boyle was Lewis's handpicked successor and was being groomed by the former president to take over the union. At Kennedy's death, Boyle took the reins to become the union president with the support of Lewis. Eight years later, Tony Boyle was challenged for the presidency by a man who was advocating the interests of the rank-and-file miners instead of the coal operators. In 1969, that man and his family were brutally murdered, and that act forever changed the UMWA. Hello, folks. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and this is Stories, A History of Appalachia. Now, before we get started, why don't you click that subscribe button down below? Be sure to also click the bell next to it so you'll be notified every time a new video is posted. And be sure to share our stories with your friends on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, TikTok, or wherever you hang out online. Steve, I've actually been waiting quite a while to, well, help tell this story concerning Tony Boyle and also the murder of um, Jock Yablonski and his family back in 1969. I tell you, I was four years old. I remember hearing the news and the accounts of this and how brutal this murder was, especially on Yablonski and his family, his wife and child there in that house. But uh, I'm telling you, it this kind of turned the United Mine Workers upside down from so much stability for so many years. And then by the time we get ready to start into a new decade into the 70s, um, it kind of upended the mine workers in a very crucial time. Well, as you'll see, that stability came at a cost, and that cost was apparently corruption. Mm -hmm. So this was, a, I guess, a pretty good shakeout for the UMWA as it went on into the 1970s, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, Joseph Albert Yablonski, known to his family and friends as Jock, was born in Pittsburgh on March 3, 1910, the son of Polish immigrants who had come to the area to work in the mines and steel mills of that part of Appalachia. As a boy, Jock began to work in the mines alongside his father, making himself a career as a miner and union representative. Now, the senior Yablonski was killed in a mine explosion, causing Jock Yablonski to become active in the United Mine Workers as an advocate for better working conditions. He was first elected to office in 1934, and six years later, he was elected as a representative to the International Executive Board. He later went on to be appointed president of UMW District 5, consisting of the Western Pennsylvania Coal Region, in 1958. Jock Yablonski was married twice, first to Ann Huffman, with whom he had a son, Kenneth. He next married an amateur playwright named Margaret Wysick with whom he had another son, Joseph, and a daughter, Charlotte. Now, the boys grew up to become labor attorneys, and in that capacity, they represented their father in his union activities. Charlotte became a social worker in Clarksville, Pennsylvania, where her family lived. Under Tony Boyle's leadership, the UMW became more corrupt, spending miners' money freely on things like the 1964 UMW convention in, of all places, Miami, Florida. The first such meeting outside of coal country. That was a little bit of a shock then. It was at the convention that opposition within the union came to the forefront, causing Boyle to tell them, If you try to take this gavel from me, I'll still be holding it when I'm flying over your heads. Well, that opposition was met with force from miners from District 19, which covered Kentucky and Tennessee. A group of those men physically attacked anti-Boyle speakers. Now, there was also the matter of a bank that the union had bought, the National Bank of Washington, D.C., which allowed the UMW to actually buy coal mines of its own. Mm -hmm. By the 60s, the bank had become pretty much a slush fund, paid for at the expense of union members' benefits. Finally, Boyle had gotten just a little bit too close to the mine owners themselves. On November 20th, 1968, a series of explosions rocked the coal mines in Farmington, West Virginia, causing 78 men to be killed. 19 of those men were left where they died, 
the mine shaft sealed off with no consultation with the men's families. Boyle praised the company's safety record and failed to even meet with the miners' widows. Mm. Now, all of this affected Jockey Blonsky, the man whose father was killed in a mine accident. He saw the problems within the operation of the union, which including forgetting who the union was formed for, and he wanted to change that. Well, Boyle removed Yablonsky from his union position as District 5 president in 1963, citing, of all things, insubordination. There were those who felt that Tony Boyle saw Jock Yablonsky as a major threat to his control of the UMW and got rid of him for that reason, including Yablonsky's sons. In May of 1969, Yablonsky announced his candidacy for the UMWA president position in that year's election. This made him the first insurgent candidate in 40 years. In the voting, Boyle beat Yablonsky 80,577 votes to 46,073, a margin of about two to one, and Yablonsky conceded, but he wasn't done. On December 18, 1969, Jock Yablonsky asked the U.S. Department of Labor to investigate the election, alleging voter fraud. He also filed five lawsuits against the union in federal court on the following charges. One, Boyle and UMWA had denied him use of the union's mailing list as provided by law. Two, he had been removed from his position as acting director of Labor's nonpartisan league in retaliation for his candidacy. Three, the UMW journal was being used by Boyle as a campaign and propaganda mouthpiece. Four, the UMW had no rules for fair elections and had printed nearly 51,000 excess ballots, which should have been destroyed, and five, the UMWA had violated its fiduciary duties by spending union funds on Boyle's re-election. And Rod, that's where things stood on New Year's Eve, 1969. Yeah, of all things, New Year's Eve, 1969, and on that night, Jock and Margaret went to bed, followed a little later by Charlotte, who was staying with them at their home in Clarksville. Six days later, concerned that his father hadn't shown up for a swearing-in of Washington, Pennsylvania elected officials after Christmas break, Kenneth Yablonski went to the house in Clarksville and found his parents and his sister dead, all of them having been executed in their sleep. Investigators were called in, and pretty soon it became apparent that whoever did this was really sloppy for they left fingerprints everywhere. That evidence pretty quickly led to two drifters, Auburn, Buddy Martin, and Claude Vealy, an unemployed house painter named Paul Gilly, who just happened to be the son-in-law of a minor UMWA official and Boyle's associate, Silas or Saul Huddleston, who lived in La Follette, Tennessee. Now, investigators pieced together a tale of conspiracy. The killings had apparently been ordered by Tony Boyle, who demanded Jock Yablonski's death on June 23, 1969, after the two met at UMW headquarters in a shouting match. In September, UMWA Executive Council member and District 19 President Albert Pass got $20,000 from Boyle, who had in turn gotten the money from union funds, and then turned around and used it to hire the three gunmen, Gilly, Martin, and Veeley. Boyle sent that money as checks to retirees who cashed them and then kicked the money back to pass. Now, the hit was to happen after the election was over, you know, in order to divert attention away from Boyle. The three gunmen tried three times previously to kill Boyle's rival, but failed. They decided to kill Margaret and Charlotte to get rid of any witnesses. The day after the Yablonski bodies were found, 20,000 miners in West Virginia walked off the job in a one-day wildcat strike in protest against Tony Boyle, who they were convinced was responsible for the murders. That same day, Yablonski's attorney requested an immediate investigation of the 1969 union election, which was granted. The labor secretary, George P. Schultz, assigned 230 investigators to the case and Attorney General John Mitchell, that's right, John Mitchell from the Watergate uh, scenario in the mid-70s or around the early 70s, ordered the FBI to help in the murder investigation. It was found that Boyle used the Union newspaper as an anti-Yablonsky propaganda tool. 
He also had 100,000 extra ballots printed up with which he stuffed the ballot box from District 19, giving him the margin to win the election. Just days after the murder, Paul Gilly, Buddy Martin, and Claude Veeley were tracked down and arrested in Cleveland, Ohio, where they'd fled. They apparently had done little rod to prevent anyone from tracking them. Uh, Gilly, by the way, was from Cleveland, in fact. Now, after the arrest, they were held in the Cleveland jail, fighting extradition to Pennsylvania. And on February 13, 1970, Gilly, who'd been the payoff man in the operation, was transferred by the FBI to the jail in Canton from the one in Cleveland after it was learned that he was to be killed to keep him from involving others in the Yablonsky murders. Also charged in the murders were Annette Gilly, Paul's wife, and Saul Huddleston, her father. All five were eventually extradited to Pennsylvania, charged with first-degree murder and conspiracy. Huddleston was a former union organizer for District 19, covering East Tennessee and also Harlan, Kentucky, and who also spent two years at Brushy Mountain for larceny back in 1946 through 1948. It turns out that the murderer had been stalking Yablonsky for quite a while before they actually killed him. In fact, the trio had come to the Yablonsky house several times, and on one of those occasions, Jock himself had come to the door when they knocked. His appearance so startled them that they chickened out of killing him right then and there. But the incident troubled Yablonsky so much that he and his sons actually followed Gilly and managed to get his license plate number. Now, there were also reports that Gilly and his wife, Annette, were originally planning to inject arsenic into Yablonsky at a rally in order to kill him and to cover their tracks, since nobody could tell who actually did the murder. The FBI announced that Annette had actually bought two bottles of arsenic from a drugstore, along with a syringe and two needles that she hid in a paper bag in her car. Now, one of the murder weapons, a pistol, apparently had been stolen from a doctor in La Follette, Tennessee, where the Huddlestons lived. The pistol was recovered by Navy divers from the Monongahela River near the victim's house. Annette Gilly and Silas Huddleston both cooperated with the prosecution and were given lighter sentences. After their release, they were both placed in the Witness Protection Program, which, if I'm not mistaken, Rod, they're probably still in it at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul Gilly and Buddy Martin were found guilty of murder and were sentenced to death. Claude Veeley had turned state's evidence uh, after pleading guilty, getting a life sentence. The death sentences were reduced to life sentences after the death penalty was overturned in Furman versus Georgia, a ruling that invalidated all death sentences at the time, including that of Charles Manson. Martin died of cancer in 1991, as did Veeley in 1999, both in prison. As of this past January 2020, Paul Gilly, now 86, is still alive and still imprisoned at the State Correctional Institution in Erie County, Pennsylvania. Also arrested was Albert Pass. He, too, was convicted of murder and conspiracy to commit murder. On May 1, 1972, the 1969 election was thrown out by the courts and a new election ordered. On December 15, 1972, in an election supervised by the Department of Labor, West Virginia coal miner and advocate against black lung disease Arnold Miller defeated Tony Boyle 70,373 votes to 56,334. Boyle himself was convicted of embezzling union funds in 1973. Then he was indicted on three counts of murder in the Yablonsky case and was tried and convicted in April of 1974. He was sentenced to three consecutive life terms in prison and died in prison in 1985. And Steve, I remember well, I think, a picture that was taken of Tony Boyle when he was in jail. I think they had managed to take one while he was incarcerated. And the man was already kind of, uh, I don't know, I would describe him a little bit more as a kind of a rough looking, but also he had been a cigarette smoking type of man, but he had whittled down to almost nothing. And I think, uh, you know, it was very sad looking at him. And, you know, on top of that, this also was the next step down in what I look at. And this is my opinion here, folks, from just being brought up, I guess, in a union family, 
this was the next step down in the order of, I guess, the regression, so to speak, of the United Mine Workers in the 70s after Arnold Miller was elected because a lot of changes took place there in the 70s, at least before the uh, the changes took place in the 80s, which we've already talked about before with uh, things about the Pittston strike and so forth. But yeah. Steve, this was such a big deal back in the late 60s, even into the mid 70s. I'm telling you, this was this was one of those things that you think was a, a movie script or at least an idea for what they got from The Godfather, so to speak. Well, let me give you a little bit more of a connection to this part of the country with this murder beyond what we've I'm scared. already done. <laughs> I'm scared no, no. of this now. No, okay, no, nothing ahead. so bad. It's, it, it's also a little bit personal, I guess. I don't know. Paul Gilly, mm -hmm. far as I know, he's no kin to me. Okay. But he could be. Okay. His dad was a coal miner in Southwest Virginia. Okay. Uh, meaning the family came from Southwest Virginia, which is where I come from. Mm -hmm. I've done some research on that, but as you can probably imagine, anybody that was kin to this fella has pretty much scrubbed him from mm -hmm. any of their family trees, you know, in any of the places you might go, like Ancestry or what have you. I right. did manage to find out what his brother's name was. He had two, mm -hmm. there were two or three brothers and a couple of sisters. And I managed to track through them that they are from this part of the country, but not that close to me. So I, you know, I'm sure he's probably kin to me, but not any way that I'm quite aware of. But yeah, he's got a connection with this part of Appalachia. That's a branch you probably would like to just, you know, cut yeah. off out there on the far end of the tree, so to speak. <laughs> well, it was really weird for me when this was out, too, because I would hear this guy's name, and he spells his last name the same way I do. Mm -hmm. And you'd hear about him, you know, Gilly this and Gilly that, and you always would be like, what? Because we don't ever do anything, good or bad, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> and to hear this guy on the national news, his name being read, kind of freaked you out a little bit, especially yeah. knowing what he did. And that's the story of the murder of Joseph Jock Yablonski, another bit of the history of this place we call home, Appalachia. Thanks for listening. Till next we meet, so long, everybody. <laughs>